1984, Part 2, Chapter 6, and Chapter 7. It had happened at last. The expected message had come. All his life, it seemed to him, he had been waiting for this to happen. He was walking down the long corridor at the ministry, and he was almost at the spot where Julia had slipped the note into his hand when he became aware that someone larger than himself was walking just behind him. The person, whoever it was, gave a small cough, evidently as a prelude to speaking. Winston stopped abruptly and turned. It was O'Brien. At last they were face to face, and it seemed that his only impulse was to run away. His heart bounded violently. He would have been incapable of speaking. O'Brien, however, had continued forward in the same movement, laying a friendly hand for a moment on Winston's arm, so that the two of them were walking side by side. He began speaking with the peculiar grave courtesy that differentiated him from the majority of inner party members. I had been hoping for an opportunity of talking to you, he said. I was reading one of your Newspeak articles in the Times the other day. You take a scholarly interest in, in Newspeak, I believe. Winston had recovered part of his self-possession. Hardly scholarly, he said. I'm only an amateur. It's not my subject. I have never had anything to do with the actual construction of the language. But you write it very elegantly, said O'Brien. That is not only my own opinion. I was talking recently to a friend of yours who is an ex certainly an expert. His name has slipped my memory for the moment. Again, Winston's heart stirred painfully. It was, an, it was inconceivable that this was anything other than a reference to Syme. But Syme was not only dead, he was abolished, an unperson. Any identifiable reference to him would have been mortally dangerous. O'Brien's remark must obviously have been intended as a signal, a code word. By sharing a small act of thought crime, he had turned the two of them into accomplices. They had continued to stroll slowly down the corridor, but now O'Brien halted. With the curious, disarming friendliness that he always managed to put on the gesture, he resettled his spectacles on his nose. Then he went on. What I had really intended to say was that in your article, I noticed you had used two words which had become obsolete, but they have only become so very recently. Have you seen the 10th edition of the Newspeak Dictionary? No, said Winston. I didn't think it had been issued yet. We're still using the 9th in the records department. The 10th edition is not due to appear for some months, I believe, but a few advanced copies have been circulated. I have one myself. It might interest you to look at it, perhaps? Very much so, said Winston, immediately seeing where this tended. Some of the new developments are most ingenious. The reduction in the number of verbs. That is the point that will appeal to you, I think. Let me see. Shall I send a messenger to you with the dictionary? Oh, but I'm afraid I invariably forget anything of that kind. Perhaps you could pick it up at my flat at some time that suited you. Wait, let me give you my address. They were standing in front of a telescreen. Somewhat absentmindedly, O'Brien felt two of his pockets and then produced a small leather-covered notebook and gold ink pencil. Immediately beneath the telescreen, in such a position that anyone who was watching at the other end of the instrument could read what he was writing, he scribbled an address, tore out the page, and handed it to Winston. I'm usually at home in the evenings, he said. If not, my servant will give you the dictionary. He was gone, leaving Winston holding the scrap of paper, which this time there was no need to conceal. Nevertheless, he carefully memorized what was written on it, and some hours later dropped it into the memory hole along with a mass of other papers. They had been talking to one another for a couple of minutes at most. There was only one meaning that the episode could possibly have. It had been contrived as a way of letting Winston know O'Brien's address. This was necessary because, except by direct enquiry, it was never possible to discover where anyone lived. There were no directories of any kind. If you ever want to see me, this is where I can be found, was what O'Brien had been saying to him. Perhaps there would even be a message concealed somewhere in the dictionary, but at any rate, one thing was certain. The conspiracy that he dreamed of did exist, and he had reached the outer edges of it. He knew that sooner or later he would obey O'Brien's summons. Perhaps tomorrow, perhaps after a long delay, he was not certain. What was happening was only the working out of a process which had started years ago. The first step had been a secret, involuntary thought. The second had been the opening of the diary. He had moved from thoughts to words, and now from words to actions. The last step was something that would happen in the Ministry of Love. He had accepted it. The end was contained in the beginning, but it was frightening. Or, more exactly, it was like a foretaste of death, like being a little less alive. Even while he was speaking to O'Brien, when the meaning of the words had sunk in, a chilly, shuddering feeling had taken possession of his body. He had the sensation of stepping into the dampness of a grave, and it was not much better because he had always known that the grave was there and waiting for him. Chapter 7 Winston had woken up with his eyes full of tears. Julia rolled sleepily against him, murmuring something that might have been, What's the matter? I dreamt, he began, and stopped short. 
It was too complex to be put into words. There was the dream itself and there was the memory connected with it that had swum into his mind in the few seconds after waking. He lay back with his eyes shut, still sodden in the atmosphere of the dream. It was a vast, luminous dream in which his whole life seemed to stretch out before him, like a landscape on a summer evening after rain. It had all occurred inside the glass paperweight, but the surface of the glass was the dome of the sky, and inside the dome everything was flooded with clear, soft light in which one could see into interminable distances. The dream had also been comprehended by, indeed in some sense it had consisted in, a gesture of the arm made by his mother and made again 30 years later by the Jewish woman he had seen on the news film, trying to shelter the small boy from the bullets before the helicopter blew them both to bits. Do you know, he said, that until this moment I believed I had murdered my mother? Why did you murder her, said Julia, almost asleep. I didn't murder her, not physically. In the dream he had remembered his last glimpse of his mother, and within a few moments of waking the cluster of small events surrounding it had all come back. It was a memory that he must have deliberately pushed out of his consciousness over many years. He was not certain of the date, but he could not have been less than 10 years old, possibly 12 when it had happened. His father had disappeared some time earlier, how much earlier he could not remember. He remembered better the rackety, uneasy circumstances of the time, the periodical panics about air raids and sheltering in tube stations, the piles of rubble everywhere, the unintelligible proclamations posted at street corners, the gangs of youth in shirts all the same color, the enormous queues outside the bakeries, the intermittent machine gun fire in the distance. Above all, the fact that there was never enough to eat. He remembered long afternoons spent with other boys in scrounging around dustpins and rubbish heaps, picking out the ribs of cabbage leaves, potato peelings, sometimes even scraps of stale bread crust from which they carefully scraped away the cinders, and also in waiting for the passing of trucks which traveled over a certain route and were known to carry cattle feed, and which, when they jolted over the bad patches in the road, sometimes spilt a few fragments of oil cake. When his father disappeared, his mother did not show any surprise or any violent grief, but a sudden change came over her. She seemed to have become completely spiritless. It was evident even to Winston that she was waiting for something that she knew must happen. She did everything that was needed, cooked, washed, mended, made the bed, swept the floor, dusted the mantelpiece, always very slowly and with a curious lack of superfluous motion, like an artist's lay figure moving of its own accord. It's, her large, shapely body seemed to relapse naturally into stillness. For hours at a time, she would sit almost immobile on the bed, nursing his younger sister, a tiny, ailing, very silent child of two or three, a face made simian by thinness. Very occasionally, she would take Winston in her arms and press him against her for a long time without saying anything. He was aware, in spite of his youthfulness and selfishness, that this was somehow connected with the never-mentioned thing that was about to happen. He remembered the room where they lived, a dark, close-smelling room that seemed half filled by a bed with a white counterpane. There was a gas ring in the fender and a shelf where food was kept, and on the landing outside there was a brown earthenware sink common to several rooms. He remembered his mother's statuesque body bending over the gas ring to stir at something in a saucepan. Above all, he remembered his continuous hunger and the fierce, sordid battles at mealtimes. He would ask his mother naggingly over and over again why there was not more food. He would shout and storm at her. He even remembered the tones of his voice, which was beginning to break prematurely and often boomed in a peculiar way. Or he would attempt a sniveling note of pathos in his efforts to get more than his share. His mother was quite ready to give him more than his share. She took it for granted that he, the boy, should have the biggest portion. But however much she gave him, he invariably demanded more. At each meal, she would beseech him not to be selfish and to remember that his little sister was sick and also needed food, but it was no use. He would cry out with rage when she stopped ladling. He would try to wrench the saucepan and spoon out of her hands. He would grab bits from his sister's plate. He knew that he was starving the other two, but he could not help it. He felt that he had a right to do it. The clamorous hunger in his belly seemed to justify him. Between meals, if his mother did not stand guard, he was constantly pilfering at the wretched store of food on the shelf. One day a chocolate ration was issued. There had been no such issue for weeks or months past. He remembered quite clearly that precious little morsel of chocolate. It was a two ounce slab. They still talked about ounces in those days, between the three of them. It was obvious that it ought to be divided in three equal parts. Suddenly, as though he were listening to someone, somebody else, Winston heard himself demanding in a loud booming voice that he should be given the whole piece. His mother told him not to be greedy. There was a long, nagging argument that went round and round, with shouts, whines, tears, remonstrances, bargaining. 
his tiny sister, clinging to her mother with both hands, exactly like a baby monkey, sat looking over her shoulder at him with large, mournful eyes. In the end, his mother broke off three quarters of the chocolate and gave it to Winston, giving the other quarter to his sister. The little girl took hold of it and looked at it dully, perhaps not knowing what it was. Winston stood watching her for a moment. Then, with a sudden, swift spring, he had snatched the piece of chocolate out of his sister's hand and was fleeing for the door. Winston! Winston! his mother called after him. Come back! Give your sister back her chocolate! He stopped, but did not come back. His mother's anxious eyes were fixed on his face. Even now, he was thinking about the thing. He did not know what it was that was on the point of happening. His sister, conscious of having been robbed of something, had set up a feeble wail. His mother drew her arm round the child and pressed its face against her breast. Something in the gesture told him that his sister was dying. He turned and fled down the stairs with the chocolate growing sticky in his hand. He never saw his mother again. After he had devoured the chocolate, he felt somewhat ashamed of himself and hung out in the streets for several hours until hunger drove him home. When he came back, his mother disappeared. This was already becoming normal at that time. Nothing was gone from the room except his mother and his sister. They had not taken any clothes, not even his mother's overcoat. To this day, he did not know with any certainty that his mother was dead. It was perfectly possible that she had merely been sent to a forced labor camp. As for his sister, she might have been removed, like Winston himself, to one of the colonies for homeless children, reclamation centers, they were called, which had grown up as a result of the Civil War, or she might have been sent to the labor camp along with his mother, or simply left somewhere or other to die. The dream was still vivid in his mind, especially the enveloping, protecting gesture of the arm in which its whole meaning seemed to be contained. His mind went back to another dream of two months ago, Exactly as his mother had sat on the dingy, white-quilted bed with the child clinging to her, so she had sat in the sunken ship far underneath him, drowning deeper every minute, but still looking up at him through the darkening water. He told Julia the story of his mother's disappearance. Without opening her eyes, she rolled over and settled herself in a more comfortable position. "'I expect you were a beastly little swine in those days,' she said indistinctly. "'All children are swine.' "'Yes, but the real point of the story,' From her breathing, it was evident that she was going off to sleep again. He would have liked to continue talking about his mother. He did not suppose, from what he could remember of her, that she had been an unusual woman, still less an intelligent one, yet she had possessed a kind of nobility, a kind of purity, simply because the standards that she obeyed were private ones. Her feelings were her own and could not be altered from outside. It would not have occurred to her that an action which is ineffectual thereby becomes meaningless, if you loved someone, you loved him, and when you had nothing else to give, you still gave him love. When the last of the chocolate was gone, his mother had clasped the child in her arms. It was no use. It changed nothing. It did not produce more chocolate. It did not avert the child's death or her own, but it seemed natural to her to do it. The refugee woman in the boat had also covered the little boy with her arm, which was no more use against the bullets than a sheet of paper. The terrible thing that the party had done was to persuade you that mere impulses, mere feelings were of no account, while at the same time robbing you of all power over the material world. When once you were in the grip of the party, what you did or did not feel, what you did or refrained from doing made literally no difference. Whatever happened, you vanished, and neither you nor your actions were ever heard of again. You were lifted clean out of this stream of history. And yet, to the people of only two generations ago, this would not have seemed all important because they were not attempting to alter history. They were governed by, governed by private loyalties, which they did not question. What mattered were individual relationships and a completely helpless gesture, an embrace, a tear, a word spoken to a dying man could have value in itself. The proles it suddenly occurred to him had remained in this condition. They were not loyal to a party or a country or an idea. They were loyal to one another. For the first time in his life, he did not despise the proles or think of them merely as an inert force which would one day spring to life and regenerate the world. The proles had stayed human. They had not become hardened inside. They had held on to the primitive emotions which he himself had to relearn by conscious effort. And in thinking this, he remembered, without apparent relevance, how a few weeks ago he had seen a severed hand lying on the pavement and had kicked it into the gutter as though it had been a cabbage stalk. The proles are human beings, he said aloud. We are not human. Why not, said Julia, who'd woken up again. He thought for a little while. Has it ever occurred to you, he said, that the best thing for us to do would be to simply walk out of here before it's too late and never see each other again? Yes, dear, it has occurred to me several times, but I'm not going to do it all the same. 
We've been lucky, he said, but it can't last much longer. You're young. You look normal and innocent. If you keep clear of people like me, you might stay alive for another 50 years. No. I've thought it all out. What you do, I'm going to do. And don't be too downhearted. I'm rather good at staying alive. We may be together for another six months, a year. There's no knowing. At the end, we're certain to be apart. Do you realize how utterly alone we shall be? When once they get hold of us, there will be nothing, literally nothing that either of us can do for the other. If I confess, they'll shoot you. And if I refuse to confess, they'll shoot you just the same. Nothing that I can do or say or stop myself from saying will put off your death for as much as five minutes. Neither of us will even know whether the other is alive or dead. We shall be utterly without power of any kind. The one thing that matters is that we shouldn't betray one another. Although even that can't make the slightest difference. If you mean confessing, she said, we shall do that, right enough. Everybody always confesses. You can't help it. They torture you. I don't mean confessing. Confession's not betrayal. What you say or do doesn't matter. Only feelings matter. If they could make me stop loving you, that would be the real betrayal. She thought it over. They can't do that, she said finally. It's the one thing they can't do. They can make you say anything, anything, but they can't make you believe it. They can't get inside you. No, he said a little more hopefully. No, that's quite true. They can't get inside you. If you can feel that staying human is worthwhile, even when it can't have any result whatever, you've beaten them. He thought of the telescreen with its never sleeping ear. They could spy upon you night and day, but if you kept your head, you could still out with them. With all their cleverness, they had never mastered the secret of finding out what another human being was thinking. Perhaps that was less true when you were actually in their hands. One did not know what happened inside the Ministry of Love, but it was possible to guess. Tortures, drugs, delicate instruments that registered your nervous reactions, gradually wearing down by sleeplessness and solitude and persistent questioning. Facts, at any rate, could not be hidden. They could be tracked down by inquiry. They could be squeezed out of you by torture. But if the object was not to stay alive, but to stay human, what difference did it ultimately make? They could not alter your feelings. For that matter, you could not alter them yourself, even if you wanted to. They could lay bare in the utmost detail everything that you had done or said or thought. But the inner heart, whose workings were mysterious even to yourself, remained impregnable.